itself. And here is another kind of example like that. And when Zabotinsky first discovered this reaction, this is also another Petri dish, and he tried to publish this to show you narrow-mindedness, the editor said, no, because this seems to go against the second law of thermodynamics, therefore it can't be true. Well, you know, you're looking at it, what does it take to convince some people that something's real? You're looking at it, forget your head, look at it, and analyze what's going on. And it's the same kind of story that we're going to extend now into the cannabinoid system. First I'll show you a little movie and I'll explain a little of what's going on here. This is a chemical reaction where electrons flow from where they don't want to be to where they want to be. All right, so if, if you have a lot of electrons in a place where they don't want to be and they can go to where they want to be, that's a potential. That's like the battery charged up. All right, so when you provide the opportunity for them to figure out how they can better do that, they wind up generating these patterns, these heterogeneities, these or organization in a liquid. You know, it, again, it's, it's so counterintuitive, but it's driven by what we call redox reaction, something that's reduced, that has the electrons, wants to give it to something that's oxidized that wants to be reduced. Look at us. We eat food, hydrocarbons. We burn them. We give off CO2 and water. It's the same as when we're heating our house in the furnace, except we do it in a controlled fashion via enzymatic reactions. But we're looking at an electron flow, basically. All right? So there's an indicator in this solution that tells you whether the local environment is either reduced or oxidized, and it gives you a color that indicates that. So I'm going to show you a little movie of this. So here, <coughs> we see the emergence of heterogeneities, of organization and order occurring in the random motion out of that liquid because of the flow of electrons in these redox reactions. So, you know, this is something we, we don't teach in our classes for the most part, very, very rare. I don't know, I hope they do it here, but they certainly don't do it at UCCS with the exception of me and those whose minds are contaminated with this. <laughs> but it becomes infectious, you know, it really does, because it answers a lot of questions. So anyway, you can see that there's heterogeneities, that the system has gotten smarter, it's less random than it started as. All right, so, life is a negentropic web of flowing energy and mass with fractal-like properties creating scales of complexity relative distance from equilibrium, free information, information, free energy and information. So what, what am I saying here? I'm saying that we have all these metabolic pathways within us. All of these chemicals are changing from one thing to another, starting with the fact that we're taking in food that gives us energy and we're spitting out waste. And we have created organization within us. It's been created in our evolutionary past, just the way that liquid organized itself. That liquid became the prebiotic chemistry on the planet that transited into life, that transited into various degrees of complexity as life evolved, driven, not, this is the key difference from, from uh, you know, total conventional Darwin. And here we're saying that organization and change is driven by flow, provided by potential and a, and a sink to empty that potential into, essentially. All right? So the question is, are nonlinear evolutionary phenomena far from equilibrium phase changes? And I'm not going to go into a lot of details here, but there are, there are certain things that I'm referring to. For example, the formation of prebiotic structures, like what I just showed you, where chemicals are talking to one another and they organize themselves automatically. And that led to the first life forms, which are known as prokaryotes. They don't have a real nucleus. There are bacteria in particular. All right. And then that led to the evolution of eukaryotes, where we have a nucleus and a variety of other uh, more complex bio biological attributes of eukaryotes compared to prokaryotes. And what we're seeing really is an increase in the complexity of the molecular organization. And that complexity means further from equilibrium. All right. It's less random. All right. And that, that led to uh, multicellular organisms, which means organis cells started to collaborate with one another, and they started to specialize with, and, and, and took on unique functions. And we see the same thing not only within our cells and our tissues, etc., but we see it in our society and the role that we play as different individuals contributing to the flow of life that characterizes mankind and his relationship with this environment, because obviously everything is dependent on the flow from the environment to create and nurture the creativity and our movement from equilibrium. And that led to something known as deuterostomes, and I'll explain that in a minute. 
And that ultimately led to mankind and consciousness. So we're looking at a path of how change occurred. All right. So chemosynthetic and photosynthetic life forms first arose after about a billion years of producing biomass and oxygen. These life forms now had potential. Something new could happen again. Because what they could do is they could start, if they could develop the change and change their biochemistry, they could start to burn all of that plant material, you know, that, that, the material that was captured in life by photosynthetic and chemosynthetic organisms, and use that, which is what we do, right? We're burning, we don't make our own food, we're called heterotrophs, we use food from others, but it's the autotrophs, the plants and the photosynthetic bacteria that make food by capturing sunlight or capturing energy out of specific inorganic chemicals and use that to create life, okay? So, a new potential for novel creative solutions occurred when you built up all of this biomass in the early, in the early origins of life on the planet. And they did something really profound because they made oxygen. They were photosynthetic. So that's what gave the opportunity then to have life forms that could burn, which is what we do. We're burning. We give off heat. Feel us, you know? We just don't go up in flames. We do it in a controlled, slower manner. All right? So this, you know, this led to what's called the Cambrian explosion. And in that, the growing presence of biomass and oxygen destabilized the biosphere's chemistry enough to create them create a far from equilibrium phase change that sped up evolution tenfold. So the links, and this is my, my hypothetical work really, that the, it's the links between this flowing energy that leads to these nonlinear changes that characterize evolution. All right, but it's all based on Prigogine's work, and he did get the Nobel Prize, and he's really, in my mind, one of the most profound thinkers that the planet has ever seen. He's up there, I'd say even higher than Newton and Einstein, because it's just the level of complexity of what he's done is so incredible. So anyway, the growing presence of biomass oxygen destabilized the uh, biosphere's chemistry enough to create far from equilibrium phase change that sped up evolution. Feeding behavior driven by the endocannabinoid system drives the evolution of deuterostomes and man. Now, we will get into more of that. Does the evolution, does the endocannabinoid system drive the evolution of deuterostomes? What are deuterostomes? Deuter we have two kinds of uh, what's called a superphylum, an early bifurcation in the way life occurred. Proteostomes do not have an endocannabinoid system, all right? It has to do with how the opening in us formed the opening, right? We've got a mouth and an anus. That's, we have a tube running through us. And that tube can form head first, which led to these organisms, all right? Things, essentially insects, lobsters as well, things like that, all right? 